Awesome to welcome Youngstown State head coach Jared Calhoun to the basketball podcast. Calhoun owns an 11 year career record of 220 and 134, has 96 wins at Youngstown State, and owns a 76 and 52 record over the last four seasons. He has elevated the Penguins basketball program to unprecedented success, including the 2023 Horizon Regular Season Championship, the first coach in program history to do so, and for which he was named the 2023 Horizon Coach of the Year. Calhoun began his coaching career as an assistant at Walsh University. He then joined Bob Huggins' staff at West Virginia, where he spent five seasons and helped the Mountaineers reach four NCAA tournaments, including a Final Four appearance in 2010. In 2012, Calhoun became the head coach at Division II Fairmount State, where he turned them into a national powerhouse, winning four conference titles and reaching the national championship game in 2017. Coach Calhoun, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Well, great to have you. I know you're just fresh off a trip from Spain and uh, the foreign trip. So uh, tell us a little bit about that and that experience and uh, some of the things that you're trying to accomplish in in that time to get ready for such a trip. Yeah, um, well, we had 10 practices. So really just trying to lay the foundation, uh, both sides of the ball, really uh, implemented a lot of our offensive concepts. Um, didn't want to get too carried away with the playbook, uh, but just really wanted guys to understand you know, some of our basic offensive philosophies. And then the same thing on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, As far as Spain, Chris, uh, I thought it was a tremendous trip. Um, We got a chance to play um, in Jose Calderon's place. Uh, Team USA, USA basketball will be there in two weeks. Um, Just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. We played three games in seven days. So it was really exciting. Great life experience for all. And uh, you mentioned the offense and getting ready in that short time, but uh, let's focus more on just the overall philosophy to start with. And I know one of the big things for you is to find, create, and keep advantage. And uh, talk to us a little bit about how you try and approach that. Yeah, you know, it's um, something that we really um, talk about on a daily basis of each possession. You know, I think that's why basketball is one of the greatest sports. Uh, Things happen so fast. Uh, So I think we do a lot of things trying to get our guys. There's a lot of ways uh, you can get an advantage on offense, uh, whether that's, you know, on a defensive rebound and transition on a spray, uh, whether that's a, a, you know, a mismatch, uh, which we call Waldo action. Uh, whether that's off ball screening or a ball screen, uh, we want to find that advantage um, right away in the possession, first six seconds, create it, and then keep it uh, to get a really good shot. Well, I love the phrasing fight for spacing, which is what you refer to as the first six seconds. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we're a little bit unconventional, Chris. So on makes, um, you know, we're in a five out, but we have our two guard take the ball out. A lot of people have their forwards take it out. Uh, We want to have multiple actions uh, with inside the action um, in a half court setting. Uh, But for the first six seconds, we want to beat our opponent down the court uh, and create a lot of space on the floor uh, for sprays or drives um, and certainly open up the floor. So we want to fight for that in the first six seconds of the shot clock. So having your two guard take it out is one of the reasons that you can play early and opposite to them so they can get to space. And then obviously you can run multiple actions with handoffs and different things off the top. Is that the idea? Yeah, we call it our fast series. Um, So we, we want to get the ball out fast in the first six seconds. We have a package, probably seven, eight things, but uh, we want to move that five men around. Uh, So we want to get into some flare ball screens, some pitch ball screens, uh, we run some off-ball screening action. So we run our both forwards, uh, one to the right corner, one to the right wing. Um, and then we're going to initiate offense, uh, you know, really from our two uh, two guard, our, we call it our trigger man, uh, taking the ball out. I love that phrasing, fight for spacing. Are, are you're sprinting to corners, uh, where, and then in terms of five out, uh, 45 slots in terms of the other positions? Yeah, we're going to fill both corners. Uh, point guard on makes, going to bring the ball up the left uh, wing. Uh, our two will trail, uh, and then our uh, two forwards will be opposite, uh, right corner, right wing. So uh, you run that type of delay action that uh, a lot of teams run, then you're running that delay action to your two. Is that a primary attack place, too, off the top? Yeah, yeah, we'll flare them there. Uh, we can pitch back. We can get into splits. Uh, we can get into Spain action, which we added this summer. Uh, so we'll come down. We'll reverse it to our 
uh, our trigger man, which is our two, and then our, our forwards will initiate our Spain action. So uh, really just try to manipulate uh, the low man uh, and manipulate some matchups out of it. I love that. You go to Spain, you got to have the Spain action when you go to Spain, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's great. Uh, you, we talked about obviously finding uh, the advantage, uh, creating the advantage. What is the philosophy on neutrals? Well, when it's five on five neutral, you mentioned Spain as an option, as a trigger to be able to try and tr create an advantage. What are some other primary ways that you're trying to create an advantage out of neutral? Yeah, we could we could cross screen. Um, you know, certainly we want to have a good variety uh, of things in our offense. I think um, the thing about basketball is when you can be unpredictable um, and you can just trust the eyes and you can play uh, with your instincts. Um, you know, those are the best type of offensive teams when there's player movement, ball movement. Um, so we have different things in our package, whether it's off ball screening, um, you know, flares, uh, which we call our pinch action. Um, there's a, a variety of things uh, that we try to do. And are these conceptual or are these calls or they're both? How do these things get triggered? A little bit of both. Um, you know, occasionally we'll free flow and, and see where things take us. Um, certainly on, um, you know, ATOs uh, or walk up situations where we're, we're at the free throw line. We spend a lot of time to try to be elite um, end of clock because our league, the Horizon League, uh, last year, I believe, was number one league in America uh, for close games. Uh, so you've got to understand and value these possessions. We try to generate as a staff 20 to 30 points, uh, whether that's blobs, slobs, ATOs, uh, whatever it may be throughout the course of a game. We want to be really efficient in those areas. Well, we'll jump back to your staff again, but since you brought it up, I mean, you also have a special teams coordinator as one of your staff members, right? And that's one of the reasons you have it, I assume. Yeah, constantly studying, um, you know, every level of basketball, um, you know, whether it's high school, uh, college, uh, you know, the NBA, the G League, Europe, uh, we want to keep up with the times. We want to evolve. Um, so our special teams coordinator actually today just presented on two teams uh, that we've studied this offseason, Northwest Missouri State and Liberty. I think they do a great job with their screening angles. So just constantly trying to get better in the offseason to implement those things. But our special teams coordinator, um, basically on a daily basis, we meet um, and we talk about what the week's going to look like and map it out, uh, whether it's a blob, a slob, a full court play, uh, a two for one, uh, any situation that we can think of, we want to make sure that we've covered it with our guys. So in terms of covering it with your guys, what are you doing with them? Are you practicing it on court? Um, are you diagramming it? Are you including video? What is it uh, in terms of from uh, creation to install? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, you know, typically what we do is uh, 10 to 15 minutes of film. Um, on some of our install things, we'll do it right on the floor on video. Um, hey, we're going to add these three or four actions, um, and then we'll walk through uh, in the beginning. Whatever we're going to add for the day, um, we're going to show them visually uh, on film, and then we're going to walk through it, and then we're going to start our practice. So we try to map it out like that. I think guys can comprehend that stuff better. There's a million ways to learn. I think you have to figure out what suits your team. Um with this group, uh, a little bit of film, and then certainly having the time this summer to walk through some of those situations has been beneficial. Love this. And uh, I'm imagining from what you're saying, you're very adaptable each week that you're adding and subtracting. You're not always keeping the same package, right? Yeah, I think coaches have a tendency to, to go too fast. Um, you know, I certainly have learned that. I'm going into year 12 as a head coach. I'm certainly better than I was uh, last year and certainly better than year one. Um, and I've really tr tried to slow down. Uh, I think concepts are so much more important uh, to understand than an actual playbook. Uh, I think teaching guys the, the proper steps to read uh, a pick and roll, different coverages, off ball screening, those sorts of things to me, Chris, are very beneficial to the player. And it teaches them how to play. I think a lot of times we can get caught up in certain plays, um, but I think you got to teach your guys how to play. Um, through a lot of preparation. I think it's, you know, visual and then certainly uh, through a lot of things on the court uh, in our read series. When I read between the lines of what you're saying, I can think about myself too. And I think about the trying to balance between intensity and understanding and getting players to understand. And, and you're at this point where you know the value of your players understanding it almost more than the intensity, right? 
Yeah, I think, Chris, what you have to do, it has to be collaborative uh, in your film sessions. A lot of times we'll have the players lead it. Um, you know, talk me through this play from start to finish, not just their position. Um, it could be good or bad, but I think that's the only way you get to understand um, your players um, and their what they're seeing. Because at the end of the day, uh, we can have the best plays we want, um, but if they're not understanding and, and reading the defense, um, you know, these things aren't going to work. So I think that's uh, where we have changed drastically um, over the last couple of years. Uh, part of uh, I'm imagining your development, like many coaches from, you know, beginning to now this stage of coaching that you're on as well is also to be able to remove your ego and remove things that don't work. So talk us through that, because sometimes some of the things that I'm sure you you think will work don't work. So can you share some of that experience with us? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, I think all of us have great ideas um, and we have a you know, a style that we may want to play. Um, one of the really neat things about my journey, you know, I've been pretty much every level of basketball uh, from, you know, power five to division two to mid-major. Um, so I've been able to see uh, quite a bit. Um, and I, I think you have to really study your team and, and understand your team's strengths. Um, and you may have the best idea, but it may not be that particular uh, idea works well with that group. Um, so we've certainly... Uh, tinkered things from week to week. I, I think it's day to day. Uh, I think you have to come into practice and, you know, back in the day, you you diagram, you know, a week of practice. Uh, I, I find myself uh, scratching that idea. Uh, I think it's day to day. I think there's certain concepts, certain packages you got to get in, um, but you really got to see how your guys process the information uh, to move forward. I love that point. I mean, I remember trying to season plan and weekly plan and all that stuff. And it's just got to be more adaptable nowadays, doesn't it? And that's uh, such a great point. And back to offensive philosophy a little bit. You mentioned this concept of uh, the Waldo um, mismatch. So talk just through a little bit in terms of attacking, uh, say, a slower player. Let's start about that. What are you doing to be able to attack a matchup when you have a speed advantage? Yeah, we we just we talk with our players about where's Waldo, right? The old, uh, you know, find Waldo in the book. Uh, we want to do that, uh, you know, on the offensive side of the ball. There's a million ways to find the Waldo. I think a lot of players think it has to be through a pick and roll uh, where his man, uh, whoever's Waldo's guarding, has to get into the pick and roll. But uh, it could be on a back cut post. It could be on a flare ball screen. It could be, uh, you know, off ball screening actions. There's a million ways you can attack mismatches. But uh, I think the, the most important thing is teaching your players uh, how to do that. Uh, so we do a lot of Waldo drills at practice, um, you know, really try to exploit mismatches. Um, you know, so much of today's game is, uh, you know, happening really, really fast. So I think you have to teach the players at practice what that mismatch looks like. Uh, it could be throw back, throw in. It could be uh, throw back, attack, attack. Uh, you know, now we're sealing that guy. Um, so we do a lot of Waldo drills uh, to master the mismatch game, which I think is, you know, really what you're trying to do in basketball uh, is is find that advantage. Um, so that's how we kind of do it. Well, I love that. And I'd love to hear more about those drills because I, at the end of the day, I mean, that's very conceptual in a sense, right? But then you have some specific actions or concepts that attack those depending on what type of matchup it is. Yeah, I think, you know, whatever your playbook looks like, um, how can you create some of those mismatches? I think, you know, it's our job as coaches uh, through scouting, uh, is to manipulate some of those matchups. Uh, you know, that that's a big part of coaching. Uh, I think all the top offensive minds uh, can see the game. They can do that throughout the course of a game. Um, sometimes, you, you know, you may go into a game and uh, think that you have a Waldo. Well, that kid has, has a great, uh, you know, defensive day, and you may have to adjust uh, at a timeout. Um, so, you know, we were in Spain. We were playing against two traditional bigs, and, you know, right away we went to kind of an exit play. Uh, where we're, you know, we're kind of cross match on our, our in screens where our four is, is now coming out. Um, some of those things you're seeing. Um, and then we also went to a roll and replace. Um, and those were kind of on the fly, you know, trust your eyes. Um, but I think our guys understood that, hey, this is the guy we were trying to take advantage of. And that's great. And And one of the challenges with attacking matchups is sometimes it takes you out of flow and takes you out of your system. So practicing it obviously helps it. Are you calling out within practice? Are you designated specific players as a Waldo to be able to get them used to attacking? Is that simply what the drill is? 
Yeah, typically it's it's one of our coaches, um, you know, and it has to be different guys, right? It can't just be a big every time. It could be a small, um, you know, it, it could be a scout team player. Um, so there's a million different ways uh, that you can get into those drills. But I think each coach out there that, uh, you know, has certain playbooks, uh, just figure out what works for you. Um, and then just, you know, a lot of times what we do is we, we just constantly try to figure ways to put our guys in positions to think um, and train your eyes. I mean, that to me is what coaching is about in basketball. The game is so fast. Um, you know, we want to get a lot of possessions. Uh, we want to get the ball up and down and we want to make quick decisions. Um, so the more training you can do at practice, the better. And, and one of the strengths of this I've found is that in terms of uh, getting your players to understand how to attack matchups on offense, is it helps your players defensively understand their realities, doesn't it? And how to compensate for their realities. It does. I mean, it, you know, there's two sides to the ball and, you know, we talk about fix it situations defensively. Um, you know, we have stole a lot of different drills over the years, but, you know, the game of basketball is really about rotations, um, you know, fixing the situation. Um, you know, certainly there's times defensively where you can't fix it and, and you may have to double team, you may have to dig, um, you know, you may have to figure it out on the fly, but I think really that's what our game's about. Love it. And uh, diving deeper a little bit, pick and roll efficiency for you, 33rd nationally. Um, and talking to Eric Fawcett, who, uh, you know, is obviously outstanding for you and I'm sure with the rest of your staff, but he mentioned a, a few kind of characteristics of that use of shallow cuts, use of roll and replace, and then use of slide cuts. So can you give us a little bit deeper understanding of kind of how you've been able to achieve this pick and roll efficiency? Yeah, I think, uh, you, you know, a lot of people just talk about the actual pick and roll. Um, to me, there's there's five guys on the floor. So you have to manipulate the floor. You have to have floor balance. You have to have space to operate. So we call uh, a lot of different things in our off-ball cutting schemes. Uh, we call it a Clyde. So if we, we're in a side ball screen on the, right, on the left side. On the right side, we want a Clyde. So we want a corner cut and we want to slide. Uh, sometimes we'll flare it. Um, sometimes we'll interchange. So we want to be unpredictable off the ball. Then in the pick and roll, we want to be really, really efficient. Uh, so we do a lot of different read drills, right? So we'll do every sort of coverage in the preseason, whether it's drop, whether it's ice, whether it's switching, uh, hard hedge, flat hedge, uh, a blitz. We want our guys to understand every single pick and roll coverage, not only in the pick and roll with the two players, but the other three guys to me, are just as important. Um, so uh, we try to do a lot of different read drills. We put five minutes on the clock. If we have five missed reads, uh, we'll get it down and back. And it's really just about understanding that possession, um, you know, what we're trying to do and how we're attacking that coverage. Well, and again, it just, it's, it's so cool to hear you talk about this because it just, it kind of paints a picture to me that your players are so adaptable. That in going through all those experiences, if you want to throw something at them that they not have necessarily practiced as much, they're very adaptable because they practice with very conceptual concepts throughout your year. Yeah, I think so. And then, you know, in our, uh, you know, our video work, um, individually position work, uh, we're really, uh, you know, not only looking at their selves, but we do a lot of NBA comparisons, right? So we ask our players who their favorite player is. Um, and we really study, uh, you know, we study cutting. Uh, how impact you know what kind of impact cutting can have screening uh to me screening and cutting are the two biggest keys in basketball uh shooting uh whether it's left to right right to left top step uh you know reading defenses on off ball screening coverages uh these are all things that we try to do um within our our, our offensive system and i think that's made us an elite uh, really, really elite offensive team um, but it's personnel you know chris you have to have great players. Uh, but I think one thing we've done a really good job the last two years in the transfer portal is identify guys that fit our system. Uh, our system is, um, you know, really, really conducive to today's game. You know, our forwards are going to be able to take and make threes. Uh, they're going to be able to handle the ball. Uh, kids want to all do that. Um, and then our, our guards are going to have a lot of freedom. Um, so it's going to be free flowing and it's going to be a fun style that you have to understand how to play. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're very enjoyable to watch. I watched a number of games and getting ready for this. And, uh, uh, you know, to connect the transition offense a little bit that we talked about earlier, the fight for spacing, the first six sec seconds, uh, transition offense, 11th nationally. 
And we can talk about your influence on Joe Missoula because that's obviously a big part of um, him as well. But he's had an influence on you in this domain as well. So maybe talk about both sides of those uh, from his influence and your influence and your partnership with him at Fairmount State. Yeah, it's obviously a uh, really, really special relationship. Um, anytime you get to coach with a guy that you coached, uh, you know, I coached him at West Virginia. Uh, there's a special bond there, Chris, certainly. Um, you know, I was the best man in his wedding and uh, he spent a number of years with me at Fairmont State. And then when I got the job here, uh, the first thing I did before I met with the team was to make sure he was going to take uh, the Fairmont State job. Um, you know, Joe is very, very loyal. Um, I give him a lot of credit. Um, you know, for for leaving the G League and taking that job. But from a basketball uh, perspective, and, uh, you know, I'm constantly studying them. You know, my girls are the biggest Boston Celtics fans now. Uh, but we share a lot of ideas. Um, you know, I really study what uh, what he did offensively this year. I thought was was masterful. I thought he did a great job uh, being unpredictable. Um, you know, so we, we share a lot of different ideas. A lot of the stuff that I got on our fast series is certainly from him. Um, but just, you know, just catching up with each other daily. He's actually going to come to town here in a couple of weeks and do an event for us. Uh, so it's a really, really special relationship. Well, I love it. Uh, you're both lifelong learners, I can tell. And uh, obviously, great, great relationship in terms of that. And, uh, you know, um, the half court efficiency numbers, again, like you talk, talk about this, like transition offense, 11 nationally, half court efficiency, 18th nationally. And uh, a lot of that, you talked about a little bit of this, but let's go in a little bit deeper about this concept of combining structures for these initial triggers. Yeah, um, you know, we kind of try to break it down, you know, concept wise. So we play a lot of four on four, a lot of three on three, um, get into those actions before we really even implement our offense. So our guys understand um, you know, what those things look like, what type of reads we're looking for. Then as we install, um, you know, we're certainly looking looking for a high percentage shot. Um, you know, we want to fight for space in the first six seconds. If we get into so we call it level one, level two, and level three. So level one is first six seconds. Um, you know, we want to spray. We want to ride the wave. We talk about the, the floor, the middle of the floor being an ocean. Uh, we want to get downhill and ride that wave. We want to cross the floor. And then as we get the ball back, um, that's when we want to have multiple actions. Um, and then level three is really play after the play. And I think that's when you know what type of team you have uh, is when you call things, they don't work your guys know how to play play the game. Uh, but we do a lot of different uh, things in practice um, that that certainly, I think, really help our guys. Well, I love that. And you already mentioned this, but like the, the one main thing is this concept of uh, leveraging the advantage or keeping the advantage. And I just don't think we talk about that enough. And certainly when I see all these trainers on Instagram working with players on creating an advantage, not enough probably on leveraging and keeping the advantage and that's a big part of what you just said there so talk to us i don't know we call it dominoes once you have the dominoes falling you keep them falling but uh what are some different ways that you help your players understand to be able to keep that advantage well i like that dominoes i may i may have to steal that one from you i've certainly stole enough stuff uh from you over the years um you know i i, I think there's just different ways um you know creating some double gaps on drives can create an advantage uh you, you know, uh, playing out of the middle of the floor, there's different ways you can create advantages. Um, you know, we've been studying screening angles, how you can create advantages, uh, you know, whether it's flipping the screen, whether it's, uh, you know, a flat back ball screen, whether there's, you know, brush screens, different ways uh, to, to keep that advantage. Um, I think our guys just had great, co they've had great cohesiveness the last couple of years. And I think when the players understand how to keep the advantage, advantages when you have good offenses and you know the ball has a lot of energy uh Chris the ball is a powerful thing I always tell our guys the ball tells you where to go it talks to you um it can't really you know verbally talk to you but it does you know if there's a uh, a drive from the corner we got to have a crack back we got to have a guy around the ball we got to have a guy coming home to America we got to get a drift we got to get a 45 so we have a language that our guys really understand. I think it's so important. Um, and I think the great programs have that, a great understanding of what their language is day in and day out. And it's not just on the offensive side, it's both sides of the ball. 
Well, that's such a good point, both sides of the ball. And that's really what it is. It's covering up for advantage and it's trying to create advantages on those opposites. Basketball is definitely a game of opposites. So maybe in practice, are you doing some advantage, disadvantage drills in terms of some dynamic starts to be able to create that advantage initially and then learn how to play advantage and try and fix it, as you said? Yeah, one thing we try to do in the half court is we'll play a lot of five on four. Um, and then we'll just give them rules. Uh, so we've got five, per, you know, guys on the perimeter. We've got four in, two at the elbows, two on the blocks. And we'll play for three minutes. One team has the ball and we'll say nobody can cut this three minutes or, you know, a number of dribbles. Um, the other thing we try to do is we put eight seconds on the clock. We play three on three. Um, you can't shoot. So whoever the coach throws it out to, you've got to go create an advantage for somebody else. Um, constantly putting our players in situations uh, level one, level two, and level three uh, inside the shot clock. So our guys understand 30 seconds is a long time. Uh, I would like to see the shot clock move down to 24. Um, I think that's that that needs to happen. Uh, I know we went from 35 to 30, uh, but I think it really teaches the guys how to play and play with each other. Um, so we're certainly doing a lot of those uh, advantage drills offensively. And, you know, it's really good for our defense too. Did you play 24 seconds in Spain? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it great? I mean, I've coached FIBA forever, so I'm totally on board with what you said. And I, I cannot everything I tell because I get asked a lot about, oh, the Spanish system, the Serbian system and all this stuff. And I tell everyone, yeah, there's good coaches. There's bad coaches everywhere. But you know what compensates for it? Having a 24 second shot clock. Just players right. get to make more decisions and get to develop more. And that's what they do in Spain and the rest of the world. And if America ever did that, look out. <laughs> yeah, I think it should be just universal. Uh, yeah. I think all the way from high school to college and certainly at the professional level, just keep everything. Um, I think it would help our players understand the game a, a, a lot better. I couldn't agree more. It's absolutely true. And coach, I got to say, I mean, I, I see all these efficiency numbers and I can understand it because the way you speak and this is a, like you speak efficiently. And I imagine that translates to your players just understanding. And I find that with a lot of coaches that I work with, trying to get them to understand how to say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't kind of add all this fluff, just like in practice, remove fluff and get right to the point. That's got to be a big part of what you've developed in practice to be able to get to this level of expertise. Yeah, it's a big part of our culture. It's a big part of who we are. Um, you know, we're pretty, pretty honest people throughout the recruiting process. Uh, if we're recruiting guys you know, that that can't shoot the ball, we tell them, hey, we're going to work with you and you're going to be able to shoot the ball. You know, we took a kid last year uh, that had never made a collegiate three. Um, he just signed first division Germany. Uh, he shot 35 percent from three after four years of college. He never took one for us. Uh, he, he he took him and he made him and he shoot, shot at a very good clip and it helped him become a professional basketball player. So I think when you're in there, you're working with them, uh, whether it's skill development, film, if you're honest with them, you work with them, they're going to get better. And then as you could teach your team, hey, this is what we're looking for. Um, there's got to be some give and take offensively. Guys got to have some freedom. Uh, I always tell them we're going to take some bad shots. Um, you know, that that's a given. Uh, but we just have to make up for it on the other end. OK, so let's dive deeper into that. You said a few words there that uh, I want to dive deeper into this process of developing shooting. And I imagine, because you mentioned freedom, I imagine a lot of what that development was for that player is suddenly you're giving him permission and freedom to shoot it. And then is there a technical component to that as well in terms of the development? Yeah, we do a lot of shooting, um, you know, individually, uh, Chris, and then also team uh, wise, um, you know, that that really kind of shows our guys um, who can shoot and who can't, um, you know, whether that's, you know, for time, whether that's for makes, um, you know, there's certainly a time for form shooting and volume shooting and um, that sort of thing. But I'm a big proponent at practice. We, we've got to put some limits. We've got to put some some clear goals on those things. Um, and then when we start hitting those targets, we're going to feel really, really confident in the game um, to make those shots. Yeah, and are you changing mechanics for that particular player uh, in terms of helping them get a little bit more efficient shooting? It? Yeah, I think, it, you know, every everybody's different. You know, everybody's right. shot is different. Um, you know, so as we get these guys coming in, uh, we've got to certainly look at the shots, see where they're at. Some guys, it, it seems like a lot of college guys now are, are dropping the ball a little too much. Um, so we do like a whole catch-up series uh, on how to keep the ball high, to get the ball out quicker. 
um, some some of those types of things. Um, but you know, nowadays with the portal, you can recruit uh, guys that that are efficient shooters. Um, so that certainly helps as well. Well, and I was going to mention the portal because part of the challenge of the portal is that you might have less time with the player to be able to change and develop some of those things as well. Chris, I think that's a great point. I, I think you have to be really, really smart the way you recruit in the portal. Um, we kind of have a formula at all five positions. Um, you know, what we're looking for from a, from a skill set. Uh, we really want guys that come from winning programs uh, that know what winning basketball looks like, not just on game day. Um, I think so many people think it's just those 31 games, but it's the preparation, the preseason, the summer, uh, really what goes into winning, what drives winning uh, in your program and in the locker room as well. Yeah, and and coaches talk a lot about like analytics, obviously driving how you play, style of play, different things like that. But analytics are having a huge impact on recruiting, aren't they? And especially with the portal. Yeah, we're really big. Um, so we we have a couple people we use. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Eric Fawcett, um, just been a tremendous asset to our program, kind of an unsung hero for us here in Youngstown. Uh, met him one night researching uh, drop coverage. Uh, I saw a whole piece on him. Uh, he, he was writing about uh, drop coverage. It really kind of um, enamored me. So I direct messaged him. And next thing you know, I call him our special ops guy. Um, so he does special projects three, four times a year, whether it's um, a deep dive into a team, whether it's preseason scouting, whether it's some practice clips that I want him to look at, uh, helping us install our offense. And then we use HD analytics, uh, which is now, I think, uh, you know, representing about 80 different schools in Division One basketball. And they they have a lot of different tools that you can use. They actually rank every Division One player uh, in the country. They actually have a number that, that really measures uh, both sides of the ball. And we use them for scouting as well. So that's one area I've really changed, uh, really took a deep dive into analytics, tried to understand it. Um, you know, and certainly Coach Missoula has helped me understand that as well. Wow, that's wonderful. And uh, I know the other part that uh, was tremendous for you at Fairmount and you've continued on is this this idea about fundraising your league and really getting into the community and making a huge impact. And that's got to be even more important nowadays with this NIL atmosphere, right? Yeah, you know, it started at Fairmont State. We were the first school in that conference uh, to put our guys in summer school. Uh, then we were one of the first schools to to you know, ride around on a charter bus. Uh, then we were the one of the first schools to have a, a theater room. Um, you know, we want to be different. Uh, you know, my college coach, Raleigh Massimino, um, you know, he he really, really treated me great along with my teammates. Uh, you thought you were at Duke. Um, and that's really been my motto everywhere I've been. So as the rules have changed with NIL, I think, you know, I hear a lot of coaches complaining about it. Um, I think you have to adapt. It's just like the transfer portal. Um, we have a city here in Youngstown that's really, you know, jumped on board uh, with NIL. And I think it creates great opportunities for these players when they're done playing. Uh, you know, not every player you get in your program is going to play, uh, you know, basketball when they're done. So to, to meet some of the people that they have through, through our NIL program, uh, it's been really neat to see. That's such a great slant on it to be able to get them to be able to be in front of future employers or potentially be people that obviously can help them in life. That's such a big part of this. And uh, that that's just so cool to hear that slant on it. And uh, it strikes me again that, uh, you know, you're, you're focusing on solutions and not problems. And we can talk about the problems all we want, but those don't ultimately help us. And you're a solution based coach, aren't you? Yeah, Chris, I think you have to be, um, you know, so many things have changed over the last five years. You hear a lot of coaches uh, uh, tired, worn down. I, I think all of us, um, you know, work really, really hard uh, at all levels of basketball. But, uh, you know, I'm the happiest when I'm in the gym working with the guys. Um, certainly there's things you don't like with your job, but uh, to sit around and complain about it doesn't do any good. Uh, so we've always rolled up our sleeves no matter where we were. Um, and really had a, you know, a we over me mentality. Um, you know, we want to do it together. We can't do it individually. Uh, um, so we're going we're gonna to be much better, much stronger as a group. Well, the success speaks to that and uh, just tremendous. And, uh, you know, another part that keeps you working is uh, obviously your league with just the diversity of zones that you play against in your league. It's got to be fun somewhat to be able to prepare from game to game because you're playing against a lot of different styles. But uh, talk to us a little bit about, about zone preparation, zone efficiency, 39th nationally, and uh, obviously a lot of different styles. Yeah, you know, when I entered this league, I could never imagine there'd be so many different zones. 
two. We'll see a matchup zone, a one, three, one, uh, just a million different ways uh, to play defense. But uh, we try to, we try to run a, a really nice package. Uh, we'll screen the zone. We'll flare, you know, flare this zone. We'll ball screen it big on overloads. Um, really, really big on overloads. Um, you know, uh, some one, four stuff, but, you know, I think it's just, you know, offense is offense, whether you're playing man or zone, you have to have spacing, uh, you have to have ball movement, you have to have cutting. Um, so we really went to a really kind of a free flowing uh, Rover two type offense where three guys were kind of interchanging on the perimeter. Two guys were kind of just, you know, being basketball players, they could really have the freedom to do whatever they could screen it, they could flash, um, they could overload it. And I think once again, when you're unpredictable, uh, against man or zone that you become a hard team to guard. But yeah, we certainly see a lot of different coverages inside the Horizon League. And gone are those days where it's like, I still hear this somewhat from coaches, but gone are the days, oh, we need this against a 2-3, this against a 1-3-1, one, one, this against a 3-2. Like gone are those days, right? Well, I'll tell you what, you saw it in the NBA, um, you know, with the Miami Heat. Um, so, you know, what helps us, uh, we see a lot of zone. So our guys don't, um, you know, they don't play sideways, you know, they don't play East West when they see a zone, but you saw in the NBA, I thought Eric Spolster did a masterful job inside his zone. They did some really neat things. I thought with the top two guys and ball screens uh, where they kind of X'd out and, and did some different things, but you know, a lot of those teams don't see it. Uh, so that was an unpredictable thing to do. Um, and it gave a lot of teams problems. And I think that's what coaching's about. Yeah, it's so fun to kind of little mess with the game and go, get in your lab and figure out some solutions to different things. So I can tell that you enjoy that as well. Talk to us a little bit about a uh, Youngstown State practice. What are what are we seeing at practice? A lot of offense versus defense, a lot of conceptual. You've already kind of painted that picture. What are some other things that are a foundation of your practice? Yeah, um, well, the first thing is we, we, we got to understand, um, you know, what we're going to do that day, what we want to explain to our players in our short 15 minute meeting. Uh, we'll show them, you know, typically uh, six to seven clips on both sides of the ball. Uh, we're going to cover culture every single day. Um, you know, we're going to we're, we're going to never, ever, you know, skip the steps of talking about culture, see how they're doing. Um, and then we're going to dive into it. Uh, you know, our practices are, are I think, short, sweet, um, to the point. Uh, we don't want to overdo it. Uh, we want, you know, a good friend of mine that that helped me so much in coaching, Billy Hahn. Um, you know, he recently just passed away. Just a tremendous person. Great coach uh, at West Virginia. He always said we want fresh minds. We want fresh legs. Um, and I think that has really resonated with me, Chris, for a long time. So we don't typically go over about 90 minutes, um, sometimes maybe two hours, uh, depending on the time of year. But uh, we want a good warm up. And then, you know, typically the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, are going to be skill work, uh, you know, whether it's our, our finish series. Uh, we label all our finishes, NBA uh, names, so our guys know right away, hey, this is the finish we're going to work on. Uh, some sort of volume shooting, uh, a read drill every day. We're going to get into some sort of read, whether it's off ball or pick and roll reads. Um, and then some sort of progression drill, right? Getting our guys making decisions. I think you can always find early in practice what type of attention they're going to have. If you throw a drill on them right away, um, you know, whether it's a five on four, or four on three, or a read drill, where's their attention at for the day? Um, you know, that's kind of how typically we start our practices. Um, and then we're going to get into some of our different coverages, our rotations. Over the years, I've certainly have changed uh, a lot of live action, more to the more than breakdown stuff. Uh, but we certainly do do some breakdown stuff. Uh, always going to end in some sort of scrimmage. Uh, we've done a lot of elimination endings. Um, we do a lot of, you know, down, back, down, uh, things like that of that nature. Um, and then we do what's called, we call it, uh, I, I got this uh, from Mike White when I watched him practice, Florida drill. It's basically an eight-minute segment uh, where I'm just going to free flow. Uh, sometimes it's something in our in our our play uh, package that we have, or sometimes it's I just want to see what guys can comprehend. Certainly did that early in practice uh, with this group and just literally diagram things, and we have two groups, and we're going against each other. Sometimes we'll throw defense out. Sometimes we won't. Um, just really want to see where guys are at. 
Great stuff. Makes me want to go to practice right now, coach. That's awesome. Uh, you, you, you mentioned culture, and uh, I know during film sessions, you talk about, a little bit about culture clips. Can you give us a perspective on what that would be? What would be a culture clip that you would share? Yeah, you know, it could be our huddles. Um, you know, it could be our bench. Uh, we've done a much, much better job the last two years of understanding, um, you know, the it's a we over me mentality. It's strength in numbers. So one to 16 or one to 15, whatever we have, we got to get all 16, 15 guys moving in the right direction. Uh, so you're looking at huddles. Uh, you're looking at when guys fall down at practice uh, from our managers to our coaches. We want to be the first to pick them up. Um, it could be some examples of, of other teams. You know, we're constantly studying different teams, different cultures. Um, it could be a guest speaker. You know, we do what's called a character class each week. So we really try to focus on in our character class, the character of our individual, of our players, but the overall character of our team, what we want it to look like. Um, so we bring in a lot of different guest speakers, but, um, you know, we do a lot of different things with our guys as far as culture. Well, I love that. That's such a great example of connecting it to your team and what they're actually doing and in short clips. And uh, that's part of your philosophy, short practices, short clips, get the information they need and don't overload them with a lot of fluff. And I found in the past, we used to have too long of film sessions, too long of practices and, and players don't align with that anymore. Do they? I don't think so. You know, I think basketball so long, um, you know, I, I worry about injuries. Um, that's one of my biggest fears in coaching uh, daily. I don't know why that is, uh, but we've had some bad luck over the years with some really key pieces. So um, we want to keep them fresh. We don't want to have information overload. We want them to react. Uh, we don't want them out there thinking um, and just just go play basketball. I love that. And uh, you mentioned elimination endings. So maybe just explain that to us. What's what's an example of that? Yeah, we'll play a three minute game. Uh, we'll scrimmage, uh, you know, red versus white. And then at the end of that three minutes, we'll put a target score, just like you're seeing in the TBT. Uh, you get a bunch of situations. I find that the players like it. Um, I like to do things at practice that the players like. Um, you know, I want our guys wanting to come to practice. I, I think it should be fun. Uh, I think these guys have a lot of pressure on them daily from fans, uh, from their academics. So I want guys coming into the gym excited, ready to go. And uh, we do a lot of drills that, you know, we've gotten great feedback over the years that the players like. Well, I love that. The Elam ending uh, in practice, that's a special situation drill right there. That's beautiful. That will create so many variable situations to kind of figure out, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think it, you know, what it does to, uh, you know, whoever's coaching those teams, uh, it really puts our assistant coaches in a position of power. They coach the team. Sometimes I'll take over, but I give our assistants a lot of freedom. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate. I've had some great coaches, assistant coaches. Um, you know, I think a lot of guys talk about Joe, but we've had certainly a, a, a lot of guys um, and I just want to make sure that they're ready to go. Uh, so that's why we have an offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. We switch those uh, typically every year. Uh, so guys are understanding both sides of the ball. And now with more coaches available uh, on the floor, I think it's great for these young coaches. It's great. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because one of the hard things for an assistant coach traditionally has been to get coaching reps. And a lot of coaches used to get jobs without having a lot of coaching reps. And you're you're solving that by giving them coaching reps, especially in these special situation situations. But also, I, I was going to ask you about that. So you're uh, switching within the years what their responsibility is. Absolutely. And, and the in the scout. Right. So if one coach has a certain team, we're going to switch that up next year. Um, you know, I, I, I think. You know, most of the guys that I've worked with um, have wanted to become head coaches. And, and I think it's our job as the head coach to help prepare them. Well, the best way to help prepare them is to empower them. Um, and I think that's why a lot of guys like working for me uh, and that went on to do some really neat things uh, at higher levels of basketball. And, you know, I've had a ton of guys um, get head jobs uh, at the Division II level and a bunch of guys that, you know, uh, obviously Joe in the NBA, uh, Chinadu Nawachku is now with the Grizzlies. Uh, Sham God Wells is in the G League. Um, Jason Slay has certainly moved up the ladder. But uh, when you empower people, uh, they're going to do a great job. Uh, and I think that's what people want to do. And that's why they get into business. It's, a, it's such a great point. I just want to drive this home is like a, a lot of older coaches have talked to me about one of the challenges for them is that they got labeled as a defensive guy or an offensive guy or this guy. And you're removing that completely. And I love that aspect of it. 
Yeah, I, I think you just have to, you know, put your ego at the door. Um, you know, I ask our managers, uh, we do Monday meetings, so we'll have, you know, all of our staff here, we'll have our training staff, uh, our GAs, our, some of our managers join, um, just really getting input from people. It's really a, co a collaborative effort um, to, to really uh, make it work. I think uh, a lot of coaches uh, are afraid to do that. I don't know why. Uh, when you hire good people, just let them do their job. Um, and expand their role each year uh, and help them grow. At least we think you're just an offensive guy. You, you love defense too. I know it. You mentioned rotations a few times. You mentioned multiple ball screen coverages, maybe first multiple ball screen coverages. So you mentioned working on multiple ball screen coverages for the offensive benefit. How do you then select what's the best defensive coverage for you? Yeah, I think a lot of it's scouting, Chris, um, you know, which, which team we're playing, um, you know, we've done a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, this year we have, you know, really, really big guys. We've got great size on the front line, so we haven't used the drop coverage as much. Uh, but I think it's really personnel driven, um, you know, based on your ball screen coverages, um, trying to work through those things in the in the preseason. Um, and then just you got to get good at one or two, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, I think you have to have a secondary coverage. Um, you know, everybody comes into a game and says, hey, we want to ice, uh, we want to drop. But, you know, good, good. I always think there's going to be better offense. You know, it, it's hard to stop these teams over and over and over. So you've got to be able to adjust um, throughout a game and make those adjustments. Uh, I think that's what we've tried to do over the years. Um, you know, probably started this thing 11 years ago as a defensive coach, um, you know, obviously working at West Virginia and some of those teams and, you know, a Final Four team and a Sweet 16 team. Um, but as the game changed, uh, you know, I really just fell in love with offense. Uh, I just love when there's a free flowing and guys know how to play. But um, I think it makes you when you start to look at different defenses, uh, you know, as an offensive guy, it makes you a good defensive coach as well. Um, so I think the big thing is just finding guys um, that can kind of fit that system. Absolutely. And it, it sounds like you also value some of these situational things that we talk about in terms of ball screen coverage and scout, but also in terms of being disruptive and that extending catches and deflections. And is that situational or is that generally the philosophy that you're trying to approach every game with? You know, we've changed over the over the years here, Chris. We've we've done a little bit of everything where we've been pack line. We've been up the line. Uh, we've been a little more aggressive. Um, you know, this year with our team, we're, we're very athletic, so we're going to be disruptive. Uh, certainly, um, you know, there's some some, you know, really, really uh, important pieces to our defense. You know, I think it really starts on the ball. Uh, you have to be able to guard the ball, whether that's in a closeout, whether that's transition. Um, whether that's in a pick and roll, you have to be able to defend one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, if you can do that, you, you got a chance, but uh, you also have to build a, a wall uh, around that guy with the ball. Uh, and there's a million ways you can do that. You can play pack line, you can play up the line, you can, um, you know, help different ways. Um, so, you know, I think defenses are changing. Uh, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of creative things. We'll certainly study that the next two, three weeks, look at our film from Spain, um, and we've got to get in that top four. If we can get in that top four defensively, which I think we can, we've got a chance to be a pretty good team. In hearing you talk in general, then I, I assume you're adaptable from week to week a little bit defensively as well in terms of different things? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think certainly. I think this this team here can do that. Um, we've got some interchangeable parts. Uh, we'll probably play nine or 10 guys. So we'll pressure, you know, full court at times. We're going to play a little zone, uh, looking at some different zones right now. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of everything. I love that. Um, another thing, I mean, we talked about culture in a lot of different ways, uh, we over me, uh, and obviously the video component of it, but uh, also a big thing is the mentorship program. So talk to me about that, because I think this is one of the most important things that you can do as a coach. Yeah, so we, um, you know, last year we implemented uh, a mentorship program and basically it was, uh, you know, kind of uh, we brought in the players um, and we kind of matched them up. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, fine. I, I was teasing the guys, you know, like finding the perfect date um, if you're a single guy. We, we want to make sure our guys, uh, whether they want to be doctors, uh, engineers, basketball players, whatever they want to do, whatever field uh, that they want to get in. Uh, we want to match those guys up um, with a mentor, and they spend a ton of time with them throughout the year. 
uh, whether it was on Zoom. We we had some, you know, professional players. Uh, we had um, some different people that our guys were able to talk to because, as you know, Chris, basketball is a long year. It's like no other sport. Um, it's basically at the collegiate level about 335 days out of the year. So there's very little downtime. They spend a lot of time with their coaches, but it's somebody that they can rely on um, and really look up to and ask for advice, ask for, you know, for help uh, at times and really help guide them. So I thought it was an awesome program. Uh, we've done it a couple of years. We're going to do it again uh, starting in September, uh, but it's a big part of who we are along with our character class. I love that. I love that part of this uh, coaching process. And uh, I-, I talked to a coach recently who's a small college coach. And he said their their administration said that now he has to fundraise part of his conference budget. And I thought that was shocking. But again, sports changing, everything's changing. So give us some of your best tips for fundraising, because I know you've knocked it out of the park and uh, done so many things. Well, I've done about everything. Um, you know, I, I think you have to be creative. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, where you're at, what what's your what's the clientele, uh, what's going to interest them. Um, you know, we've done, uh, at Fairmont state, we did a golf ball drop, uh, out at a golf course. So we sold a thousand, couple thousand golf balls for $10. We dropped the, the balls out of the, the airplane. Um, and if they got to the bullseye, they, they want a certain amount of money. We've done wine tasting events. Uh, it's a great night out, um, for couples. Um, you know, we've done dinners, we've done golf outings, um, you know, we've done about every every fundraiser known to man um, because I've been at a few jobs where, um, you know, the budgets, you know, they weren't the best uh, in the conference. But, you know, for people out there, I think you got to know where you're at. You got to know the clientele, um, but don't give up. You know, it's just like recruiting. It's just like basketball, um, you know, and don't make excuses. Um, that's the biggest thing. I think you have to go find a way to get the money. Um, and get, get for what, you know, you really have to provide for what your guys need. Um, you know, whether that's a summer school budget, whether it's an extra pair of shoes, um, whether that's an extra meal, um, we have what's called the six man here. Um, so it, it helps provide, you know, our guys, uh, massage therapy, you know, we have a massage therapist that goes on all our trips. We do some things that are very different, um, holistic approach for our players that a lot, not a lot of mid-major schools are doing. Well, I love that. That's great advice. That golf golf ball drop. Cool, cool idea. Um, and, and again, it's it's. I reflect on my alumni and talking to them about it, and the community and talking to them about it. They were kind of tired of like the gala or the golf tournament, and they just said, "Hey, let's do something fun and creative, and you know, kind of just make it this one thing." So that's such a great idea for that. And uh, I imagine a lot of people are in those situations. So that advice is tremendous. Yeah, you're ma- you're making me laugh because that golf ball drop was something else. People had never heard of that. Um, <laughs> it was a huge success, actually. I'm sure it was. It's creative. It's fun. It's different. People get engaged by those things. So I, I'm sure people now will be stimulated to think of some other ideas. And coaches, if you think of them, send them to me and send them to coach and uh, we'll we'll get a good kick out of it as well. Coach, obviously your success has been tremendous. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's so many coaches now that are going to follow you even more closely and uh, try and learn more from you. But uh, talk to us a little bit about Bob Huggins, obviously the incredible impact he's made on the game and so many people and so many coaches. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing that that we talked about earlier was empowering your assistant coaches. Um, you know, I started with Coach Huggins as a student assistant at the University of Cincinnati and then uh, went went with him uh, to West Virginia uh, back in 2007 as the director of basketball operations. So I uh, was with him uh, for six seasons. And I think the best thing he did is, as far as getting his assistants ready uh, was empowering those guys. Um, you know, whether if you handled scheduling, uh, you're going to handle scheduling to, to the best of your abilities, whether you're handling the budget. Uh, he did a tremendous job. And I think one of the things that gets unnoticed Uh, about his cradle of coaches, all of his guys have won. And I think that's a direct reflection uh, of him empowering those assistant coaches, Um, you know, from Andy Kennedy to Mick Cronin to Frank Martin to Brad Underwood. Um, There's a lot of great coaches that have come under his tree uh, that he's helped train Um, and and certainly uh, forever uh, grateful for the opportunity that I had. I I thought I was with him, um, you know, at the perfect time. You know, we followed Coach Beeline. Coach Beeline did a tremendous job, went into West Virginia, inherited a great group of guys. 
Uh, first year, go to the Sweet 16. The third year, we go to the Final Four. I never thought I would leave them. Uh, never thought I would leave West Virginia unless it was a Division I job, but decided to go to the Division II route at Fairmont State. It was the best decision I ever made. And, um, you know, he he advised me to do that. Uh, he said, if you want to be a head coach, Jared, this is the way to do it. Um, and I'm forever grateful. Well, he's had an impact on so many coaches, including this guy who worked his camp at Cincinnati. Maybe you were there. I can't remember. But when I was really young and, uh, you know, I, I just remember the, the balance between love and intensity and all the things that Sean threw from that, but also his willingness to give his time. I mean, I was just a young coach that wanted to ask a question or two, and he always took time to be able to answer those questions. And I thought that was one of the most impressive things that I was around at that time when I traveled the camp circuit, because not every coach did that and not certainly not every head coach did that. Yeah, I, I get so upset when when guys don't want to share information uh, or guys don't let guys come to practice um, or you don't take a phone call phone call from a young coach. Um, you know, just was not my my the guys I've worked with and the guys I've spent time with. We just weren't brought up like that. Um, so I try to do a really, really good job with that, whether it's a note. Um, our practices are always open. Um, I love having people come in, love learning. Uh, I don't have all the answers, so we're constantly stealing stuff from your uh, Twitter site. I absolutely love it. Uh, I probably look at it every single day. Uh, I'd be uh, lying if I didn't say I did, um, because that's what I do at night. Uh, my wife thinks I'm strong on Twitter, but I'm looking for new ideas in basketball, and there's so many of them out there. So, yeah, he certainly uh, was a guy that – uh, never, ever, uh, you know, turned his turned his back on anybody as far as a, a young coach uh, looking for information. Well, and now you're that guy. We can't thank you enough, coach, for sharing with us so authentically and uh, so openly as well. So thank you so much for sharing the game with us. Chris, thanks for having me on. It's a big honor.